So welcome back to Matt AO1 or AO2. We're going to be talking about prime patterns today. So last time uh, we talked about prime numbers. So uh, what are prime numbers? Well, those are numbers that are only divisible by one and themselves. And we were using them to uh, as multiplicative building blocks for all of the numbers. So by using the prime numbers, you can multiply them together and get every single other number. Um, Today, we're going to talk about why this is really, really cool. Um, last time, we also talked a little bit about the difference between invention and discovery in mathematics. And now that we've invented the prime numbers, or maybe discovered the prime numbers, depending on your point of view, well, what else can we say about them? Well, one of the things you can do is we can try to figure out patterns in sets of numbers. So for example, um, if you started with the natural numbers, well, the, there isn't really a pattern to that since that's just, uh, well, counting, right? So that's just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. So let's be accounting. And we don't really think of that as having a different set of patterns because that's just, well, the number is one after another. But if you were to think about the negative numbers, for example, well, that seems to do, uh, well, because of the way we constructed them, that does have a pattern. Minus, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, and so on, right? And so, well, you'll see that the pattern is that the negative numbers look just like the, po just like the positive natural numbers. And in fact, you can write down a formula for the negative numbers by relating them back to the natural numbers. So like you can say the formula is, a n, where a n is the uh, nth negative number, is equal to minus n. Okay, so the first negative number is minus one. The second negative number is minus two. The third negative number, uh, a three, is equal to minus three. Okay, so that's just a way of formalizing a little bit what it means for uh, to look at look for patterns in the negative numbers. And this isn't a very interesting pattern because the pattern is, oh, well, they just kind of look like the positive numbers except for the negative sign on them. But things get a little bit more interesting when you start having um, more complicated sets of numbers. So for example, the even numbers. So what are the even numbers? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and so on. Well, you can write down a formula for this as well, um, and this lets you uh, and this lets you formalize the sort of pattern of these numbers. So the formula for these numbers is a n is equal to 2 n. So the first even number is 2. The second even number is 4. Uh, the third even number is 6, and so on. And you can keep on going. Uh, and uh, other sets of numbers, you can keep on do the same thing. So like multiples of 3, that's 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, and so on. So the formula here. Uh, should be pretty obvious. It's n is equal to 3n. And um, you can get more complicated formulas. In fact, oftentimes the sets we're interested in have slightly more complicated formulas than this. Um, so for example, the odd numbers, uh, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 19. Oh, the <laughs> 19 is not the next odd number. But we can, you can keep on going. And so then you get a formula. That is, uh, a n is equal to 2 n minus 1. So the first odd number is 1, the second odd number is 3, and so on. OK, so you guys may have seen these sorts of like pattern finding in mathematics before, right? And so somehow, if you think about the even numbers, we've defined that as all the multiples of 2. But then the odd numbers, uh, We've defined it as any number that's not even, right? And so then you even though you can still get a formula for the odd numbers, even though it's slightly more complicated. And indeed, one of the things that mathematicians do is we try to find patterns in sets of numbers that we have defined. And sometimes these patterns can get a lot more complicated, or sometimes these patterns have um, these patterns are take a little bit more time to describe. And that's quite important because when you're describing uh, these numbers, there are different ways of um, f describing a pattern that you found. Um, and it's not always to write down a single formula. Sometimes it's writing down multiple formulas and saying when one works and when the other works. But there's still this goal of trying to find patterns in uh, sets of numbers. So let's take a look at a few more complicated sets, and then I'll have you guys try it out. So, um, so all positive numbers less than or equal to 12. 
Well, this is a set one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. But note that unlike the other sets you were looking at, this doesn't go on forever. This only goes on for twelve numbers uh, because the set has size twelve. So here you have a n is equal to n, but only for n from one to twelve. Okay, so you still have a formula, but you now have conditions on the formula. Um, or things like all even numbers between 19 and 31. Well, what that looks like is, well, you have 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, and 30. So again, this is a finite set, <clears throat> because you don't have an infinite number of them. And uh, writing down the formula is a little bit more complicated, and so you don't, like, but you can still write down a formula. It's not always necessarily the most natural way of describing it. But here you'll notice that if you have 2n plus 18 for n from 1 to 6, that gives you all of those numbers uh, in that set. Um, well, you have perfect squares. So that's another infinite set. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, and so on. And so there you get an is equal to n squared. And, um, well, let's let's put down a really complicated one uh, to uh, finish off with these examples. Numbers that are divisible by either 2 or 3. So now, this is a little, going to be a little bit harder uh, to write down a formula. It's still pretty easy to describe, and so, but we can write down a formula. So 2, 3, 4, 6, uh, 8 is also divisible, 9 is divisible by 3, 10 is divisible by 2, 12 is divisible by 2, 14 is divisible by 2, 15 is divisible by 3, and so on. <clears throat> and now, you might be staring at this and be like, well, writing down formulas for this is going to be quite hard. And yes, it is. And so you probably wouldn't actually, in practice, write down this as a single formula. Um, I'm going to do it here anyway, just to show you that you can. Um, but this isn't, this isn't the most natural way of doing it. So we're going to define a couple operations, which we're going to spend a lot more time on later. So if n divided by d is equal to x remainder r, then we're going to say that x is equal to this symbol. So this is um, n divided by d and getting rid of the remainder. And then r is going to be equal to something we call n mod d. Don't worry about this yet. This is just a weird way of writing down what x and the remainder are. Uh, if that's the case, then you actually can uh, write down a formula for this, which is that it's the n divided by 4 without remainder times 6 plus 2 if n mod 4 is equal to 1. Uh, n divided by 4 time, uh, without remainder plus 6, uh, sorry, times 6 plus 3 if n mod 4 is equal to 2. n divided by 4 with no remainder times 6 plus 4 if n mod 4 is equal to 3 and then divided by 4 without remainder times 6 plus 6 if n mod 4 is equal to 0. Okay, so unless you guys have seen number theory before, this should be confusing. Um, don't worry, I don't expect you to be able to do this particular pattern. I'm just showing you that there are ways of writing down these much more complicated patterns in this way of writing down a formula. But of course, you can also just see that, well, the pattern is that um, you get 2, 3, 4, 6, and then you get, um, so another way of seeing this pattern, which might be slightly easier, is you get 2, 3, 4, 6, and then you get 6 plus all of that. So 8, 9, 10, 12. So that's the pattern. Uh, which is that you have groups of four and then you add six each time. Okay, any questions about this so far? So this is just, uh, well, you have groups of numbers and you're trying to do find some kind of pattern in them. And will this be tested on for on this quiz? No, it won't. Uh, this quiz will be exactly like your practice quizzes. Um, so none of the material we're covering today will be on your quizzes. Okay, so, but let's, let's, let's try it out now. So, let's go over here. Find a simple formula for the following patterns. And now, I should caution that, of course, 
what it means, I should caution that, of course, what it means for formula to be simple is often a matter of taste. So like, what does it mean to put something in the simplest form? Um, that is sometimes a matter of taste. And so like different people might agree that different things are the simplest possible way of describing something. And that's fine, because not everyone agrees on those kinds of things. But still, it's important that uh, we have some sense of what's simple. And often, that's you have to write down less things um, to describe it. OK, but anyway, uh, where was I? Um, so are we supposed to know how to do that last part? No, you are not expected to know how to do that last part. Um, <clears throat> uh, not yet, at least, um, and not for a while. So we'll be talking about like those weird. I uh, gave that party because I will be introducing a bunch of weird symbols. Um, uh, the modular arithmetic, like, is actually closely connected to what we described earlier with clock arithmetic, and that will be something that uh, we will study probably after reading week. Uh, let's around or around reading week is when we'll get to that uh, subject. But I just wanted to sort of introduce this as something early on. Okay, let's see. What are we getting? Okay, so we have uh, an A, some Bs. Oh, so mostly C. Okay, yeah. So uh, let's see uh, what happens. So we have this pattern. One thing you can do is, well, maybe what happens if you subtract by 1? So then you get 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, and so on, which, as uh, you'll notice, is just a n is equal to n squared. Undo the subtraction. So that is a n is equal to n squared plus 1. So this is indeed the pattern for this particular example. Um, OK, well, let's try another one. Uh, so uh, let me reset the chat. So what about this one here? 1, 10, 100, uh, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. OK, yeah, so we're getting a lot of um, Yep, so we're getting a lot of uh, answers that are A. And well, let's write out this formula and see if that's correct. So a n is equal to 10 to the a. Uh, so one thing you might notice is that each one is 10 times the previous one, right? So a n is equal to a sub n minus 1, because each one is 10 times the previous one. Um, because a1 is equal to 1, a2 is equal to 10, a3 is equal to 100, a4 is equal to 1,000, and so on. And you'll notice that this is just the formula a n equals to 10 to the n minus 1. OK. Let me uh, give you another very complicated one again. So again, I don't expect you to be able to do this one. Um, uh, but you can try if you want. So, but like, you don't need to guess this one because you're not going to easily find the formula. Uh, let's see. So what would the formula for this one be? Well, some of you may notice that this is the, oh, ah, go away. So this here happens to be the Fibonacci, uh, the Fibonacci sequence, which some of you may have heard of. So this is the Fibonacci sequence. Which has a lot of nice connections to things like turtle, sh uh, sorry, the things like well, not the shells, um, and the golden ratio. So this has a lot of nice connections to those kinds of things. This is the Fibonacci sequence, um, and the way you normally see this in school is you define it as a n is equal to a mi n minus one plus a n minus two, uh, where the first one is equal to one and the second one is equal to two, and so each time you're just adding up the two previous uh, numbers. And that gives you the Fibonacci sequence. Now, you might be wondering, uh, can you get a single formula out of this? So like, this seems really complicated. And we have this sort of recursive formula where you define things in terms of the previous one. But I mean, none of these four formulas really works. It turns out there is a formula for this. Um, and I'm going to write it down. You will not ever have to, in this class, come up with this kind of formula. Uh, because this is way beyond. So this is something that you wouldn't see until probably B44, so a differential equation. So don't worry, this is just a, so this is a really complicated formula. But let me go ahead and write it down. So an is equal to 1 over the square root of 5 times 
uh, 1 plus the, uh, root 5 over 2 to the nth power minus 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the nth power, um, and all of that times uh, 1 over root 5. So as you can see, this is not something, um, so that this is really complicated. But we still have been able to figure, this, is, this formula, if you plug in numbers, even though there are these weird square roots of 5, even though the sequence itself is all integers, you will find that it magically comes out to be the, the correct Fibonacci sequence. Um, if that's something you're interested in, maybe you want to be a math major. Um, and then that's something that you would learn in uh, probably B44. Um, or maybe maybe you'd learn it in A23. Or you might learn it in linear algebra, but you, um, or you, you'd either learn it in linear algebra or differential equations. So let me just throw out there if you want to be able to come up with these sort of magic looking formulas. Um, but don't worry, that's not something we're going to be discussing in this class. I just want to give it highlighted as an example of um, some of the more complicated formulas that uh, mathematicians have come up with over time. OK, so uh, any questions so far? OK, great. So well, that's all like pattern matching, right? So let's try to ap apply this. Uh, are we, uh, let's see, there is the, oh, no, okay, yep. Um, so let's try to apply all this. What about the primes? So uh, I'll let you stare at it for a moment, but one of the things that mathematicians try to do is you try to stare at groups of numbers and figure out the patterns in them. Like this is something mathematicians have been doing for millennia, honestly. But 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, like maybe there are some traits you can see. Like most of the numbers are odd. Well, all the numbers are odd except for uh, 2. Um, like the numbers uh, go on, uh, like the numbers seem to go on uh, on and on. So maybe they're an infinite number. Uh, we also need to double check about that. Um, but like it's really hard to find patterns in these things, right? <clears throat> And so then there are a couple questions. One of the central questions that mathematicians have, and this is a really big question, <clears throat> is what is the pattern of the prime numbers? Is there a pattern to the prime numbers? Um, I mean, clearly, there's some way of, you can compute the prime numbers using the uh, Irat Tofts and these uh, sieves that we talked about last time. But it seems really, really hard to figure out exactly what pattern is going on here. And this is an open research question. So by that, I mean that no one really knows the answer. We figured out some patterns, but we still don't know how exactly what numbers are prime a priori. Like, no one knows a formula for all the prime numbers, um, even though people have been studying this for literally thousands of years. But let's try to answer a couple easier questions. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask, uh, let's see. If you have any thoughts on, about this, put this in chat. Um, even if you don't have, if you don't have thoughts, uh, this is not an official participation mark question. So, uh, just if you have uh, some sense of this, throw it in the chat. So, how many prime numbers exist? Some of you may have seen this before. Ah, okay. So a lot of people have seen this before. They're an infinite number, and we will be going through that proof because. Um, <laughs> Yes, many, too many, too many. Yes, infinity is considered by many to be too many. Um, what about this one? If p is a prime, how big is the next prime q, where q is bigger than p? Depends. Yes, yes, whoever said depends, uh, Karishma, that is the correct answer. It depends, and no one knows really a a uh, better answer for that in general. Um, okay, so let me give a couple other questions that you don't have to answer because they're quite complicated. Sometimes when p is a prime, all the numbers immediately following it are not. This is called a prime desert. How often does this happen? So like, how often does it happen that after a prime you have a bunch of numbers without a prime? Um, sometimes when p is a prime, so other than 2 and 3, the next number will never be a prime, right? Because only odd numbers are prime other than the number 2. Um, but um, sometimes, uh, more often than large numbers, uh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. So um, these are really, uh, so like there is that sort of intuition, right? Like maybe if numbers are small, then primes will be more common. Um, and this actually is true. 
Uh, and this can be quantified, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, sometimes primes are really close to each other. So sometimes you have consecutive, um, well, consecutive primes, um, uh, which are called twin primes, because they're um, where you take a number and you move, you, the next odd number also happens to be a prime. And lastly, if I pick a random large number between two numbers, n and m, what's the chance that it'll be a, a prime? And so this uh, gets at um, uh, Malik's suggestion, which is, well, maybe primes happen more often um, with small numbers than they do for large numbers. And this is true, but like figuring this out is a little bit complicated. Okay, so, oh, I guess many people already answered this, but uh, let's give everyone the opportunity to properly answer it now. How many prime numbers are there? Okay, yeah, so that's sort of give me give me problem uh, question because I already gave you the answer a moment ago. But yeah, there are infinity uh, primes. And this has been known since, antiqu uh, since antiquity. We've uh, known this for a very long time. But let's uh, go back and uh, think about uh, what it means to prove something again. And as I've said many times in this class, I don't really expect you to be able to reproduce these proofs, but I want you to be able to read and see and understand what it means when someone is proving something. So we're going to prove that there are an infinite number of items. So how do we prove that there are an infinite number of items? So one way is to show that there is an infinite sequence without repetitions, which is all um, in that set. So for example, if you had the natural numbers, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Well, I just gave you an infinite sequence. Uh, and it turns out <clears throat> that, that's one way of proving that they're an infinite number. But you can also show that, um, for example, if you used all the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, and so on, is uh, can use this. Uh, use that, which is also an infinite sequence. OK, and by that, I just mean that um, if you show that there are an infinite number of odd numbers, well, then you know that there are an infinite number of numbers, because odd numbers are numbers. Um, and you can show that there are infinite even numbers as well. And uh, one way of doing that is you can give this example, where um, let's see. Oh, uh, is anyone else having, can everyone hear me? Apparently there is an issue with some amounts of muting. Someone just direct messaged me. Uh, okay, so other people can hear me. So uh, yeah, so I'm afraid uh, if I muted on your screen, it is uh, not on my end. Sorry about that. But yeah, so uh, we also have an infinite number of even numbers. So one way of sharing that is just, well, taking all the even numbers and sharing that that is an infinite sequence, because you, there's always an even number bigger than the last even number. Um, or you can use, say, uh, 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, uh, because these are all even numbers. That they, um, and if any subset of the even numbers is, um, uh, is infinite, then uh, clearly then uh, the even numbers are infinite. So this only works, though, because we can figure out a simple formula for these sequences. Because you can figure out the formula, you can show that, oh, well, this formula for this set of sequences is um, infinite. Oh, yeah. Let me resend the polling. Yep. But the issue is that this only works because uh, we don't know any formula, even for a subset of the prime numbers. So the, this is not something we know. Like, we know some formulas for things we think might be infinite sub uh, subsets, but we don't know a good formula for all the prime numbers. So this means that we unfortunately can't easily figure out um, uh, the, uh, that there are an infinite number of prime numbers directly. So instead, we're going to uh, use something called a proof by contradiction, which some of you have seen before, which you, all of you, uh, you have probably seen before, and I've used in this class. But let's uh, go through this explicitly. So what does it mean to have a proof by contradiction? So let's say that uh, we have, uh, uh, let's see, oh, are my animations in the wrong order? Oh, my animations are in the wrong order, which is a little bit sad. But so um, let me go ahead and get all the animations out then, since I sort of want them there. 
So some of you may have played the old board game Clue, uh, where you start off by uh, someone's murdered at a dinner party, and you're trying to figure out which guest did it with which murder weapon and where. So if you happen to know that the uh, guest that was murdered, Mr. Body, was murdered in the village room with a candlestick, then uh, and you know that everyone but Co Colonel Mustard was in the dining room when the murder happened, um, and you suppose that Colonel Mustard was not, uh, then we want to show that if uh, Colonel Mustard must have been the killer. So one way of doing this is uh, to give a supposition. So if we suppose that Colonel Mustard was not the killer, so this is our guess. So we're going to assume that Colonel Mustard was not the killer. Well, if Colonel Mustard was not the killer, and everyone else was in the dining room, so they couldn't have been uh, murdered Colonel Mustard, then that means that no one murdered Mr. Body. But, of course, that's a contradiction, right? Because we know that Mr. Body was murdered, so therefore one of these facts must be wrong. Um, we don't know which of these facts must be wrong, but if we're sure of the first two facts, then that means that the third fact must be the wrong one. And so if the third fact is wrong, then Colonel Mustard must be the killer. And so basically, whenever you're playing a game of Clue, what you're doing is you're eliminating possibilities, and if you've el eliminated all the other possibilities, then whatever remains must be true. Um, and so this is basically what a proof by contradiction is. This is basically saying, well, assume that the opposite uh, is true. And then show that that leads to some weird inconsistency in logic. Uh, and if that happens, then you know that one of your assumptions and uh, must have been false. And you have to be really careful when you do a proof by contradiction, because you don't necessarily know which of your assumptions um, was false. And so you have to make sure all your other assumptions, uh, even the really hidden and subtle ones, are true. Um, but this is a really powerful way of proving stuff about, um, well, about numbers in general. Uh, and uh, mathematicians use this thing all the time, and so do you if you ever play the game of Clue. So you're very often using a proof by contradiction lens. Um, so let's go ahead and see this proof. Some of you have already seen this because this is a very classic proof. Um, in fact, uh, yeah. So... Let's go ahead and get started. And let me write all this out, uh, because I think it's important that you see lots of these proofs. And so this is going to look very similar to our proof in Clue, but we're going to have to write things out uh, slowly and carefully, right? So let's say that we want to prove that there are an infinite number of even numbers by contradiction. So we, can't, we know how to write this explicitly. Um, but let's try to show that uh, by contradiction that there are infinite even numbers just to show that you can use this kind of proof even for things where you have a direct proof. So suppose we have a finite set of even numbers. So this is our assumption of even numbers. Um, well, len, there must be a largest even number, right? So len must be largest even number. Oh, infinite Evans. No, no, no. Um, that is not the assumption here. Infinite evens. Uh, then there must be largest even number. And that means there must be some largest even number x is equal to 2n, right? So um, for example, if you just had uh, a set 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on up through 100, up through say 2n. So there is some large, if if there are only a finite number of them, then one of the numbers must be uh, uh, must be even, clearly. I'm oh, sorry, must be equal to 2n. So you can write down your largest number if you have a largest number. Okay, so let's suppose we have a largest even number, Len. So, sorry, that means we're supposing we have a finite number and that means that there must be a largest even number. But then we run into an issue. If x is equal to 2n is even, then we know that x plus 2 is equal to 2n plus 2 is equal to 2 times n plus 1. Well, that's also even, isn't it? But 2n plus 2 is bigger than 2n. So, but then the largest even number number is not x. Contradiction. Therefore, the number of even numbers is infinite. 
number of evens is infinite. Okay, so hopefully everyone followed. Um, so that was a pretty easy example of a proof by contradiction. You're just like, well, if you had a finite number of even numbers, then you must have a largest one. And if you must have a largest one, well, what about what about that largest one, one plus two? Okay, and our proof that there are an infinite number of primes is going to be very, very similar. So what we're going to do is suppose we have finitely many prime numbers. So suppose we have finitely many primes, many prime numbers. OK, and we don't know what these are, but let's call them p1 through pn. Call um, uh, p1 through pn. OK, and we know that every other number has a prime factorization. So we know every other number uh, has a prime factorization, right? Because if it doesn't have a prime factorization, then it must be prime. So it has a prime factorization, and therefore must be divisible by one of these primes. OK, so hopefully everyone followed that. So um, if you have a finite number of prime numbers, we've defined them basically as these multiplicative building blocks. And so every other number must have a prime factorization. Well, let's consider a particular number. Let's consider the number x is equal to p1 times p2 times p3 uh, times all these numbers all the way through pn. So let's, so far, so good. That's still divisible by, in fact, it's divisible by every one of these prime numbers, plus 1. Things are now about to get real. Things have just gone wrong. But we know that x divided by pi is going to, uh, is going to have a remainder. So for, for any of these primes, um, has remainder 1 for any of these prime, for any of these primes. So it's not divisible. So it is not divisible. And this is a contradiction. And therefore, we have infinitely many primes. OK, so again, like with the other example, we assumed we had a finite set. And then we proved that there are an infinite uh, number of uh, primes. Because if you had a finite set, then I can construct you a number such that you get end up with a contradiction. And it's a little bit harder here, because the number you're constructing can't just be uh, your biggest number plus 1 or something like that. But instead, we multiplied all your prime numbers together, together and then added 1. But it's still the same kind of uh, proof. So now, uh, well, let's uh, go back and talk a little bit more about history. So uh, when did this happen? So well, let's remind you all. Numbers were invented back around 200. Uh, sorry, negative numbers were invented around 200 to uh, 200 uh, BC to 200 uh, AD uh, back uh, in China. Multiplication was invented much earlier. It was invented by the uh, ancient Babylonians around 4000 uh, BC uh, BCE. Um, Direct division was invented um, around 1500 BCE by the Egyptians. Uh, the Babylonians had partial uh, division. They had some kinds of division, but not all of them. And modern long division was invented by Henry Briggs at Oxford, um, the same Oxford University that exists today, uh, who lived uh, around uh, in the 1500s to 1600s. So now, given all these facts, when do you think we prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers? Uh, let me zero out the chat before you reply. So when did we prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers? 
So was it a long time ago or was it more recent? Okay, so we're getting a good mix of things. Um, and this one isn't as obvious, right? Because somehow this is related to multiplication and division, but also somehow it feels like a very modern sort of proof, right? Um, so the question is, how smart do you think our ancient ancestors were? And uh, let me let me give you guys a moment to uh, like eh, respond on this one. And the, the real question is just like, well, when do you smarter than we think? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, thanks uh, for resending the link. But yeah, smarter than we think. Um, that is actually true for many things. It turns out that people thousands of years ago were also pretty smart. We just have the advantage of like, uh, ah, I think you we give them too much credit. Well, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see we'll we'll see now like how much credit we uh, if Matt A O two gives them too much credit. Um, okay, so I think that, that's uh, long enough. Um, it turns out that this uh, particular proof that I showed you was first shown uh, in a textbook. So we don't know that this was actually one of those first proved, but there's a textbook with this um, proof uh, or something ba basically that was equivalent to this proof uh, from around 300 um, BCE in Alexandria in, in uh, ancient Egypt by an ancient Greek mathematician. So the correct answer here was um, uh, B. And it looks like most people were guessing D. And so it seems like, at least for this particular historical problem, we did not give them enough credit. But yeah, but it's, it's really weird sometimes, right? Because some things... <laughs> what would people in the past have used this proof for? That's a really good question. But let me ask you another question. What are you going to use this proof for? <laughs> I honestly have no idea. Never. Breath requirement. Um, <laughs> yes, honestly. Honestly. Like, appreciation. Ah, okay. So, um, well, thank you for that answer. That uh, warms my heart. Uh, getting good grades. <laughs> But yeah, and those are all good points, which is, you are probably never going to use this proof. And the honest answer is, most of the people back then are, would never use this proof. Um, yeah, like, it, it is just, like, and there are some applications where you might need this kind of proof, but for most people, you're never going to use it. Um, and that's a lot of math. So there are some things in math that are useful. Um, there are some things in math, like predicting the weather tomorrow or predicting uh, the state of Omicron uh, a week from now. That is useful math. Not all math is useful. Sometimes math is just beautiful. Um, and you may or may not find it beautiful, but it, like, I personally find Rothko's really beautiful. Like, I find Rothko's beautiful. Uh, I find Roberto Mata's surrealist paintings to be beautiful. But they're not useful. And someone else may disagree. Like, there are plenty of people who don't like Rothko's. Like, they might be a lot more partial to Mondrian's. Uh, talking about uh, fine artists from the 20th century right now. Um, and that's just as true of math as it is of art. Which is, sometimes it is useful. But very often, it's just there because someone appreciates it. And sometimes, one of the cool things is that some of this not-so-useful math ends up becoming useful in some way or another. So... We will actually make use of prime numbers later on in this class for something you all use, which I mentioned earlier, which is that properties of prime numbers, so these prime patterns that I'm talking about right now, a few of them turn, on, turn out to be really helpful for internet security. So whenever you connect securely to a bank website, you are making use of some properties related to prime numbers. But that's not why I'm teaching this class. Like, I, I'll be showing you it, but the real... <laughs> but the real answer is that these people have stared at numbers for thousands and thousands of years. And some people, mathematicians, but not just mathematicians, find it beautiful. And that's the reason why these things, uh, why people like have been playing with these kinds of problems for thousands of years before they'd end up having any applications. Um, and the cool thing is that they seem to be connected to applications in certain ways. So this particular proof probably didn't have any applications. But 
the same sort of techniques that you use for these kinds of proofs sometimes do. Like you might use these to construct uh, a building. Like the mathematics for building a building uh, is often related to geometry. And the proof that they originally had was also related to geometry. Okay, so enough waxing poetic. Uh, let's move on to a couple of these other properties in the next uh, six minutes. Um, and let me uh, and these other facts about prime numbers, I'm just going to go through fairly quickly because, um, well, I, I guess we'll prove this one. So, prime deserts. Not prime desserts, um, though there are many, many nice desserts in Toronto. So if you, after all the restaurants you open, uh, I do suggest that people go and check out uh, all the various desserts. You don't have to go to this particular dessert place, but there are so many cool desserts. But we're not talking about desserts, we're talking about deserts. Um, uh, I thought about putting a picture of a desert on there, but that seemed a lot less fun. So, uh, so our claim is that no matter how large a value of n, you can find n the numbers in a row such that none of them are prime. So there, oh yeah, if you have like uh, dessert recommendations in Scarborough, um, feel free to look, let me know. But yeah, anyway. Uh, this is one of my favorite desserts from uh, somewhere near where I lived in downtown Toronto. But anyway, uh, going back to the math, um, you have all, all these different... Um, so one of the questions we had was, how, how far away are two prime numbers from each other? And I make the claim that prime numbers can be in, as far away as uh, you want. So you can always construct... You can find a prime number such that the next prime number is very far away from... Uh, sorry. Uh, so you can find a prime number such that the next prime number is very far away. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to uh, use the factorial. So uh, just as a reminder, the factorial operation is taking everything multiplied together uh, in, uh, from 1 to 3, or from 1 to n. So for example, 3 factorial is equal to 1 times 2 times 3, which is equal to 6. 6 factorial is actually equal to 720, and so on. So this grows pretty quickly, but you are able to... Um, you are able to uh, write this out because you're just multiplying all these numbers together. And so, now I'm going to give you a solution to a sequence of n numbers in a row such that I can guarantee that none of them are prime. And that is n plus 1 factorial plus 2 all the way through n plus 1 factorial plus n plus 1. And let me just show you this by an example. So for 42, consider 43 factorial. So notice that 43 factorial plus 2 is divisible by 2, right? Because 43 factorial is clearly divisible by 2, since it's all these numbers multiplied together. And uh, it's also divisible. Uh, so if you add 2 to it, it's still divisible by 2. 43 factorial plus 3 is divisible by 3, and so on, all the way through 43 factorial plus 43 is divisible by 43. So notice that what we have here is we have 42 non-prime, so composite numbers. So composite numbers in a row. Okay, so uh, clearly we're uh, so notice that these are pretty big numbers though. So in order to find these prime deserts, you oftentimes have to get the really big numbers, and then you only have uh, some stretch of without them. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and give you a couple other uh, prime. Uh, facts about prime numbers, and then we'll finish off. So we also have other known facts about prime numbers. So for example, um, for any integer bigger than 3, there's always a prime number between n and 2n. So for example, uh, between 5 and 10 uh, must be a prime, be a prime. And in this case, we have the prime 7. Um, you also have, uh, you know that between 1 million and 2 million must be a prime. At least one. So often you have more than one, but the proof says that you have to have at least one. Um, so this is not a very strong proof, but this was uh, uh, not a strong fact because it turns out there are often many more than just one. But this was actually only proved in 1852. So this actually highlights one of the uh, sort of weird facts about these prime numbers. Proving that they're an infinite number, that was something we did in antiquity, so thousands and thousands of years ago. Proving that between 
a million and two million that there is a prime, or between one trillion and two trillion. That was something we did only proved in 1852 uh, by Trebuchev. Um, and uh, an even more recent result, so 1895, 1896, we also have the prime number theorem, which actually tells you about how many prime numbers there are uh, between any two numbers. And this is incredibly powerful. Um, and the, uh, so that's n divided by, so they're about n divided by the natural log of n primes between 2 and n. So between 2 and 1 million, there are approximately, based on this formula, 72,382 primes. Uh, and between 2 and 2 million, approximately 137,849 primes by this formula. Um, note that actually, that's not quite right. This is only an approximation. There are actually 78,498 primes between one and a million. And actually, there are 148,933. So this isn't exact, but this gives us a good sense of how many prime numbers there are between any two numbers. <clears throat> And I will finish off by talking about, do prime numbers necessarily get further apart? The answer is no. Um, though, this is something that we didn't actually prove until uh, very recently. So, uh, Yitang uh, Zhang proved in 2013 that there are infinitely many pairs of uh, prime numbers that differ by uh, 70 million or less. Um, so, you might think 70 million is a pretty big number, but it's less than infinity. And before 2013, we did not know that there were any... That, you, that there are infinitely many pairs of prime numbers that differ by any finite number. The current best proof is that there are infinitely many pairs of prime numbers that differ by 246 or less. And a celebrated conjecture that no one's quite proved yet is that there are infinitely many pairs of prime numbers that differ by exactly two. So for example, three and five, five and seven, 11 and 13, 17 and 19. And right now the biggest known pair of um, prime numbers that differ by exactly two is this big number down here, which I'm not going to read off because I would just mess it up anyway. Um, and with that, uh, I think that ends today's lecture. So thank you all for so much for coming. Um, I have office hours at 12. Um, so if you have any questions, pop by office hours then. If not, good luck with all your quizzes and I will see you on Wednesday. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.